Shall we pray before we come uh, to the word? Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your revelation to us in the scriptures. Without it, we would be lost. We thank you for your grace in in speaking to us. And we pray now as we come to this uh, great passage of scripture that you would soften our hearts. And by your Holy Spirit, you would speak to us that we might grow in Christ, be rooted in him and built up in him. For his glory, we pray this. Amen. In, In our lives, some things are foundational and others are functional. Functional things make up the uh, day-to-day activity of our lives. might be looking after family, going out to work, following your day-to-day routine. There's other functional things behind that, aren't there? The hundreds of decisions that go on in our minds day by day. The thoughts, the words, the actions, the emotions. It's our functional existence day by day. But there are also foundations in our lives. Our deep-seated worldviews what we believe about ourself, what we believe about God and about the world around us. Now, those foundational things don't always show because they're beneath the surface, but we are all building on something. It's often the case we might not see them until difficult times come or we're faced with really challenging questions. Then maybe we see for a moment what we value most of all, what really drives us, what foundations there are in our lives. And in our passage tonight, Paul is addressing both the functional reality of our lives, the day-to-day, and the foundations. Now, in your Bibles, look down at uh, verse 5 of Colossians 2. I think, sorry, verse 6. So then, just as you received Christ as Lord, uh, continue to live your lives in him. The Colossians, they'd trusted Christ uh, for their salvation, but now how should they live? Well, Paul says it very simply. Continue to live your lives in him. Over the last few weeks, we've seen that salvation, forgiveness, new life come only in Christ, only through being joined to him by faith. Paul says continue then to live your lives in Christ. If the way in was to be in Christ, Paul's saying the way on, the way to continue, is to be in Christ, in Christ alone. I guess at that point we might ask, well, what does it actually mean to live life in Christ? Well, look at verse 7. Paul starts to explain, rooted and built up in him. Two descriptions there. Rooted, think of a tree. You look at it from a distance and you can see the trunk, the branches, the, the, the leaves. But if that was all there is, just the smallest gust of wind, and the whole thing would come crashing down. We know that trees need roots, don't we? They're mostly hidden, they're mostly underground, but they're the foundations. They support everything else. And Paul says to live in Christ means to be rooted in him, to have your foundations in him the foundational things of life there are worldview what we believe what we believe about ourselves about god about everything else paul says root these things in christ but he doesn't just stop with the foundations rooted and built up in him. The word built up it, it is a construction word. It means to, to build upon the foundation and to carry the building on up to completion. You see what Paul's saying? He's speaking not only about the foundation, but also the functional everyday life built upon it and all in Christ. He's so clear the foundation should be in Christ. It means belonging to Christ. That has to be your overwhelming worldview and then every single part every functional part of everyday life he says you colossians may that be in christ too friends tonight each of us have foundations 
We might not always know what they are, but we do. Things that we trust, things that we depend on, fundamental things that we build our lives on. And we also have functional lives. We think thoughts. We speak words. We decide. We do. And in this part of Colossians, Paul is zealous that believers would root all of life in Christ and build life joined to Christ. This should be our way of life rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. That's what comes when both our foundation and our functional lives are, are in Christ, with Christ, there's going to be growth, there's going to be strengthening in faith, there's going to be thanksgiving. Do we desire those things? I hope we do. I will say, well, be rooted then. Be built up in Christ, in Christ alone. But I guess as I say that, we know this is not automatic not easy and it wasn't for the colossians look at verse 8 see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on christ well think about what those philosophies and traditions are in a moment but there's one defining feature to this verse in the original it reads a bit like this according to human tradition according to elemental spirits, not according to Christ. Do you see Paul's point? If the Colossians were taken captive by these other ideas, it would mean both their foundation and their functional life would not be rooted in Christ. What are these philosophies and traditions that are coming in? Well, last week we mentioned this threat to the Colossians. Other uh, teachers coming in and promoting special ideas and special behaviours. Now, we don't know exactly what they were saying, but it seems like some were promoting Jewish traditions and, and circumcision and festivals, strict Sabbath laws. You needed all of those things to be a real Christian. Others were promoting Gentile philosophy. To be a, a real Christian, you needed to, to discipline your body. That's a type of philosophy called asceticism. Or, or you needed elemental spiritual forces. You needed to have some handle on them to really progress. These teachers weren't telling the Colossians to completely ignore Christ. They said, yeah, of course, Christ is important. But if you want to be built up, if you want to be rooted, if you want to be really a Christian and successful, then you need these other things. Now, in Colossae, these things were being openly promoted maybe today we, we think about that and we feel relatively safe as far as i know no one in this church is promoting circumcision or new moon festivals maybe this isn't such an issue for us i think we need to be careful here remember paul is talking here about the the foundations of our lives and, and the functional outworking of our lives we need to be honest with ourselves. Aren't we sometimes tempted to build on other things apart from Christ? Maybe ask yourself what rules your day to day. It could be many things. Materialism. Pleasure seeking. Pride. And what do we depend on? Is it Christ? Or is it outwardly Christian things? One of those is a gracious saviour, and the other is only outward presentation. What about our worldview, in, in who we are, in what we want, in what we dream? To what extent does Christ take preeminence? All of these things are perennial challenges for believers, because we are still surrounded by other ideas, other philosophies, other behaviours. People might not be promoting circumcision or ascetic practices, but each day the world suggests to us fine-sounding ideas and strategies, ambitions and behaviours. They say, build on these things, all will be well. 
And each of us will be tempted in different ways with different things. The question tonight for us is, will we be rooted and built up in Christ or in other things? And to make the case that everything and all the Colossians and every one of us should be rooted in Christ, Paul spends the next seven verses proclaiming the absolute all-sufficiency of Christ. I think we see four huge reasons to root ourselves and be built up in Christ here in these verses. As we work through, perhaps you want to be asking yourself, is my life rooted in this Christ or in something else? Am I building everything in and on and through him? So four reasons to be rooted in Christ. And the first is this. With Christ, you lack nothing. With Christ, you lack nothing. We're looking at verses 9 and 10. In verse 9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The full abundance of God, the whole divine nature of the eternal God dwells in the person of Christ. He's a real man like us with body and soul, mind, will, emotions and all of God's unchangeable nature, all God's perfections in him. Friends, that's who he is. What about the Colossians? Well, verse 10, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. There's a direct parallel there between in Christ all the fullness of deity lives and you have been filled in him. In Christ you have been brought to fullness. Paul wants the Colossians to think hard on who Christ is and therefore who they are joined to. Because as believers they are united with this Christ. And this Christ is in them by his indwelling spirit. And Paul wants them to grasp just what that means. They're filled, they're saved, they're united to, and they have fellowship with the one, with the fullness of deity. I'll just think that through. If you're a Christian here, is there anything lacking in the one you belong to? Is there anything lacking in him? Is there anything lacking in the one who saves us? In the one who sanctifies us? In the one who keeps us? Just consider it the one with infinite resources dwells in you. The one who is perfectly good and pure and holy. The one who knows the end from the beginning. The one who in his divine nature is not even subject to time. He is the one in you. And at the very same time, he is a man who who lived on this earth, who knows about human life, who understands pain, suffering, joys and trials. Do you see what Paul is saying? Colossians, if you have Christ, can you possibly ask for anything higher or greater or anyone more capable than him? Yes, those teachers, they can come in and they can promote all kinds of things, but compared to Christ, it's foolishness. Colossians, if you have Christ, you lack nothing. Around us today, the world will thrust out all kinds of things as absolute necessities. And it'll encourage us to make them the foundation of our existence. But who do we really need? Surely it's Christ. Christ above everything else. If we needed more, there's the end of verse 10. He is the head over every power and authority. Yes, you could choose to hope in governments, authorities, even the elemental forces and the spiritual powers, but Paul says don't buy it. Christ is supreme over all of those two. They're all under his headship. If you belong to Christ, you belong to the king and you lack nothing. Friends, we are very quick, aren't we, to fill ourselves up with other things, with pleasures, with stuff. But how quick we forget the absolute fullness that we possess in Christ. 
Robert Murray McShane, the great Scottish preacher, said this, unfathomable oceans of grace are in Christ for you. Dive and dive again. You will never come to the bottom of these depths of grace. Brothers and sisters, in Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So should we not root ourselves in him? Build up everything on him. Because with Christ we lack nothing. With Christ we lack nothing. And second, with Christ your whole nature is changed. Looking at verse 11 and 12. With Christ your whole nature is changed. Look at verse 11. In him, in Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. Now remember, Paul is speaking predominantly to Gentile believers who, who wouldn't have been outwardly circumcised. Uh, and he says to them, you have been circumcised in Christ. So what's he saying? Well, we read it's a circumcision not performed by human hands. It's circumcision of the heart. Paul writes of this in Romans. A person is not a Jew who is uh, one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a, a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. The outward practice of, of cutting off the flesh was vital obedience in the old covenant. But it pointed forward to an inward reality in Christ. A, a cutting off, not of the outward flesh, but of the inward flesh on a heart level. What does that mean? Well, look at how Paul describes it in verse 11. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh was put off, cut off, when you were circumcised by Christ. Before we belonged to Christ, our whole selves were ruled by the sinful nature, that horrible fountainhead of wickedness which refuses to trust God and refuses to repent. Paul's saying that is cut off when you are united to Christ. And this really is the most wonderful news because our sinful nature literally made us incompatible with the gospel. That old nature that we had within us, it would not depend on God. It did not love God. It loved evil instead. And it was contrary to faith, contrary to repentance. And so none of us, no son or daughter of Adam can be saved unless that old nature is removed and we couldn't remove it because it was our nature it was fundamental to who we were it was our ultimate foundation and that's why these are beautiful words this is a circumcision not performed by human hands you were circumcised by Christ this cutting off of the old nature is Christ's work in his children to, to take away our heart of stone and give us a, a soft heart, to make us new from the inside out. Brothers and sisters, I know today we still live with the presence of sin. The old nature is still present in our bodily flesh. And yes, sometimes we listen to it. Sometimes we rebel <laughs> But in Christ, we are no longer slaves to that old nature. Though we might struggle with its remaining presence, Christ has put it off. And friends, if today you find in your heart a turning to Jesus, a longing to love him and follow him, that is a very good sign that Christ has changed your heart putting off the old nature by his Holy Spirit. That he circumcised you in your heart, breaking the power of the old nature over you. 
And friends, if he has done that most fundamental work to remove the sinful nature that would literally drag us down to eternal death, why would we choose to be rooted in anyone or anything except him? Perhaps we still have questions. How can Christ just remove that old nature from us and give us a new heart? Well, Paul explains in verse 12 that this change of nature comes as you are buried and raised with Christ in baptism. There in verse 12, your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Notice this baptism comes through faith and it results in the putting off of the old nature. How does that work? How can our whole nature be changed? Well, the old nature needs to die and there needs to be new life in its place. And being joined to Christ, being baptised in Christ spiritually is the answer to both of those. If you belong to Christ today, you are united to him as he goes to the cross to die. And in him, with him, in his death, your old nature dies. And you're also united to him in his resurrection. So just as he was raised, you are raised to newness of life, to have a new nature very much like his nature, with a, with a new heart that has faith in God and is, is filled with a love and obedience and a thanksgiving to him. It's all through Christ. It's through Christ that our old nature is condemned to die, just as he was at Calvary. Yes, today we do struggle and fight with remaining sin, but let me assure you, if you're in Christ, those are the death pangs no remnant of sin will remain at the last. When it's also through Christ that your new nature has been planted in you, that you've been given a new heart. I know we don't live according to that new nature every moment of every day, but as surely as Christ lives, the day is coming when only that new nature will remain. Friends, with Christ, your whole nature is changed if you've been circumcised in your heart if you've been baptized with him in his death and his resurrection united to him everything about you is changed so says paul should we not build all of life on him and every moment it's worth saying at this point that outward water baptism is a picture of this taking place in someone's life. When, when someone goes under the water, it's like they're buried and then raised. It's an outward demonstration of Christ taking away that old nature. A sign that by faith we've died with him. And then he's given us this new nature. We have been raised with him. In two weeks' time, we're going to explore a lot more of what that means. But with Christ, your whole nature is changed. And then third, with Christ, sins are forgiven. Looking at verse 14 here, but, but follow through from verse 13, they're connected. When you were, were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. And we know the wages of sin is death, so how is it? just that guilty sinners can be given a new nature and be raised to life. We'll look at the end of verse 15. He forgave us all our sins. That's how. Having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Paul uses legal language here. According to justice offences incur a debt and until that debt is paid we stand guilty and the level of debt fits with the crime what was our legal indebtedness 
but it was treason against the Lord, unfaithfulness, wickedness, lust, envy, outright defiance of Christ. And it wasn't just our actions. We had all defied him on the level of our will and our nature. By who we are, we would stand guilty before him. And that would leave us legally indebted. We would be owed justice. If we were in that state and stood in the courtroom of heaven, we would be condemned because we would have sinned against a holy God who is perfect in every way. And therefore, the legal debt would be immeasurable. Now, I know as I say this about the courtroom of heaven and the judgment of God, the world around wouldn't really want us to to trouble ourselves with these things. But we must. Our inner yearning for justice is a witness within us that there will be a judgment and we will all stand there before the Lord. On that day, will you be in legal debt before the blazing purity of God? Well, all of us would be by what we have done. But there is a way that that debt can be cancelled. And that is why Paul is adamant that everything should be rooted in Christ. And depending on him, we read, he forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness which stood against us and condemned us he has taken it away nailing it to the cross don't mistake what paul's saying here he doesn't mean that our debt was written off as you can have done in law today it wasn't brushed under the carpet or set to zero look at the end of the verse this legal debt he has taken it away nailing it to the cross literally this he put out from us and pinned to the cross. The debt didn't vanish. It was pinned to the cross, and it was paid. If you're in Christ, if your faith is in him on the cross, he took your condemnation. Your debt was nailed to his cross. Being the God man and the infinite son of God in flesh, he was both able to represent you there as a fellow man, and settle an eternal, eternal, immeasurable weight of justice on your behalf. With Christ, sins are forgiven, really forgiven. The debt is taken away, all of it, all of your guiltiness. That means that even though we might live with the the consequences of sin today, though we might bear in our bodies the, the wounds of shame, it will not always be that way. On the last day, when we stand in the courtroom of heaven, there will be none of that. No guilt whatsoever. No legal indebtedness. And so isn't Paul right when he encourages the Colossians to be rooted and built up only in Christ? What else? Who else can make us right with God? Who else can remove our guilt? Third, with Christ, sins are forgiven. And fourth, With Christ there is victory. With Christ there is victory. Verse 15. And this is a direct result of Christ's work at the cross. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. The word there that Paul uses translated triumph was the name given to victory processions uh, in the Roman Empire. If a general uh, won a great victory, they'd be paraded through their home city in glory, and everyone there would witness it. And their captives, those they'd taken prisoner, would be marched in front of them in chains, going to prison or to their execution. It was proof that those enemies were completely defeated. And then with the general would be his army and all he'd freed from captivity and they would march together to the feast and celebrate the victory. And Paul wants this image to be in the Colossians' minds when they think about powers and authorities. By that he means the spiritual forces at work in the world, the devil and the evil ones. Paul's already spoken about them in Colossians back in chapter 1 verse 13. For he, Christ, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom 
of the son he loves. We were in our sin. We were enemies of God. We were in the darkness. And when we were, we were serving the purposes of his adversary, the devil, the one who loves rebellion against God. Perhaps we don't often speak much about uh, the spiritual forces of darkness. But I think we should. Satan's favorite tactics are things like living without a thought for God and living for self, pleasure, and money. Don't we see that around us in the world? Well, the devil's favorite tactics would be fools to say that he's not active in this world. But as we consider those powers, the power of the tempter and all his evil ones, Paul would have us know Christ is leading a triumphal parade. Christ has disarmed and defeated those powers and authorities. Paul writes he has made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Perhaps that seems a bit foolish. Victory by death on a cross? Well, yes, indeed. By circumcising our hearts, he has removed that absolute hold of the sinful nature over us. In settling our legal indebtedness at Calvary, he has freed us from hell, that we might be trophies of his grace forever. In raising us to new life, Christ has confounded the devil's plan to condemn us to hell, and he's given us eternal life instead. Paul would have us consider Christ's victory parade, and he'd have us make that a foundational truth in our lives. And friends, can I say, day by day, this victory procession is growing. Sinners are being saved this world over. Trophies of Christ's grace and visible demonstrations that the evil one is doomed. I know it might not always seem like it today. Because around us there are human institutions that defy Christ. And yes, the the devil and the evil ones, they still prowl around seeking people to devour. But on the last day, This shall all be blindingly obvious. Every high and mighty leader of our age will bow with faces to the ground before the glory of the Lamb. And even the devil, he will cower as he is led as a prisoner to be dispatched into the lake of fire by our Lord. And on that day, everyone, everyone will see the glorious victory of Christ. Four reasons tonight to build on Christ alone. Let me ask you, what are your foundations? What are your deep-seated beliefs about the world, about you, about God? What about your functional living, your day-to-day, your thoughts, your words, your deeds? Paul would say all of it, all of it. Root it in Christ. Yes, the world around us will tell us to build on other things. Most probably, build in your own strength. But Paul here says everything, even your own strength, pales in comparison to Christ. So look to him. See his sufficiency. See that with him we lack nothing. See that in him we are completely changed and forgiven. See that in Christ the old nature has lost its grip on us. And see his victory march through the ages until he comes. Brothers and sisters, look to Christ. He really is all we need for life. Put your roots down into him. Build on all he's done. Read of him. Pray to him. Commune with him. And even then, if all the world comes crashing down, you cannot be shaken because he is sufficient for it all. The whole of life and the whole of eternal life ahead. May our confession always be, all I have is Christ. Amen.